form. So Hebrews and uh, chapter 6, and uh, we'll begin at verse 9. So Hebrews then and chapter 6, beginning at verse 9. Now, though I have spoken in this way, yet when it comes to you, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints, just as you're still doing. Now we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness, to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. And so when God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself saying, surely I will bless you and multiply you. And so Abraham, having patiently waited, obtained the promise. Now we know, don't we, that people swear by something greater than themselves. And in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. And so that by two unchangeable things, in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this hope as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the holy place behind the curtain. That's where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Let's pray. Lord, we've just read that you were the God who cannot lie. And we know that Paul says the same thing to Timothy. And Lord, as we think of you, the God who cannot lie, we recognize our God how in day-to-day -day life we are surrounded by lies. And we don't know who to believe and we don't know who to trust. But Lord, you are not able to lie. You are the God whose very nature is truth. And so our God, as we come to worship you today, what we read in our Bibles is truth. What you have promised to us, your people, is true. What you say about yourself is true. And Lord our God, what you say about your son, Jesus Christ, is also true. And Lord, we recognize how in our everyday lives, if we want to believe something that someone tells us, we no longer ask them to swear an oath, but we do try to find out how sincere, how sure a person is. And Lord, you understand that, you recognize our weakness. And so our God to convince us that you are the God who is true and to convince us that what you've told us is true, Lord, you have sworn by yourself because there is no one greater than you. And so our God, we are not here today to listen to opinion. We are not here to listen to experiences. We are not here to concentrate on our feelings. Lord, we are here to set our thoughts on truth, an eternal truth. The same truth, our God, that you have shown from the very beginning of human experience. 
And so, our God, as we set our minds on that which is true, we ask, Lord, for your help and for the power of your Holy Spirit to enable us to do so according to whatever our situation is, according to whatever our need may be, whatever kind of week we had last week. Lord, we are here today to hear truth. Lord, we have read that you are our God, the God whom we worship, the God who has made us your people. Lord, we come because we have read that you have given your people a hope. And Lord, our theme for this morning is hope. And Lord, our God, we have thought about hope on many occasions. We, together in church life, have looked at what the Bible teaches about hope. We have made a contrast between the hope that is found in the Bible and the way we hope on an everyday kind of basis. And so, our God, once more, we're going to think together about hope. So we ask, Lord, your blessing. We pray, our God, for the ministry of your spirit present here among us that we might, our God, leave here with a stronger sense of hope than when we arrived this morning. So we come before you, our God. You are the everlasting God. You are the one who has made the heavens and the earth. You are the God who is forever the same. Lord, you are the God whose glory fills the heavens. You were the God who loved the world so that you sent your son. So that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but shall have everlasting life. Lord, we come then to worship. We come to cast our cares upon you. We come to pray for others. Lord, we come to rejoice as we pray for others, our God. We think of those in our families, in our communities. We think of those, our God, in our four nations who are living without Christ and without hope. And Lord, how long now have we prayed for those who we love and know and live amongst and work with? But Lord, we've read this morning about Abraham having to wait a long time for you to keep your promises. And Lord, we can identify with that because we too feel that we've been waiting a long time for you to do what you have promised. So here again, we are this morning, our God, praying for others. Lord, our prayers are primarily for the salvation of those that we love and know and live amongst. But Lord, there are other concerns Concerns to do with the coronavirus, Lord, concerns to do with uh, poverty and uh, so many are God. And we commend such to you, knowing that we have no solutions, but you are the God whose love embraces the world in which we live. Lord, we pray for the church of Jesus Christ. We pray for it in our own communities. We pray for it, our God, throughout our nations. And Lord, we meet today knowing that throughout the world, your people will also meet today in different places and different contexts, in different numbers. But Lord, we are your flock. And you will feed us today throughout the world, sustaining and keeping your people. Lord, our prayers extend to Shukin and Pushpa today <clears throat> and the situation in Bangladesh. As we hear the news this week of India and what's happening there with the coronavirus. Lord, we ask your blessing upon them and your protection of them. Lord, we think of others we know throughout the world. We pray for them and commend them to you. And so, our God, we bring our praise back to our own congregation. And we pray for those who are isolating due to uh, planned surgery. We commend uh, those to you. We pray, our God, for each of us here in this building with our concerns and our experiences, with what, our God, we are living through day by day and week by week. 
We pray for ourselves here this morning. Lord, we commend ourselves to your grace and your mercy and your compassion. We pray, our God, for those who are joining us via Zoom, and we ask your blessing upon them today, that as they worship with us, our God, uh, your truth would equally capture their minds and hearts, and that together we would be built up and encouraged. Lord, for those of our congregation who cannot come and who do not have access to the internet, we pray for them. And we've been mindful of them, our God, during this whole period. And we ask your blessing upon them too. So, Lord, our God, here we are. We are not here, our God, for any other reason, but we may have fellowship with God. We may hear God speak to us. We may know the power of God at work in our lives, and that, Lord, we may rejoice as a result. So hear our prayers then, as we present them to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father. Trust us against us. So let's turn then to Romans and uh, chapter 15. Romans 15, and we're going to focus on one verse in this chapter. <laughs> But let's put that verse into a context. So in your Bibles then, Romans 15, verses 14 through to 21. Romans 15, verse 14. Now I myself am confident concerning you, my brethren, that you also are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge, and able to admonish one another. Nevertheless, brethren, I have often written more boldly to you on some points, reminding you because of the grace of God given to me, that I might be a minister of Jesus Christ uh, by, uh, the, to the Gentiles, uh, acceptable, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. So I have got every reason to glory in Jesus Christ in the things which pertain to God. For I will not dare to speak of any of those things which Christ has not accomplished through me in word and deed to make the Gentiles obedient in mighty signs and wonders by the power of the Spirit of God. So that from Jerusalem and around about to Elycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. And so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named lest I should build on another man's foundation. But as it is written, to whom he was not announced, they shall see, and those who have not heard shall understand. And of course, our verse is verse 13, verse 13 of Romans 15. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, that you may abound in hope, by the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's read verse 13 again. And we read there these words. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If we think what we've done so far then, our theme is the power of God. So starting on Easter Sunday, we saw that the power of God was on display in the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. And when God's power raised Jesus from the dead, that was a declaration to the world that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you remember that next we saw that the power of God 
is present in the gospel. This message, God's message to the world. Whenever this message is preached, God's power is present. And so we've just read about the Apostle Paul planning to go to Rome and then to Spain in order to preach this gospel, which is the power of God. It's a message that centers on the Son of God, Jesus Christ. And there's no other message. There has never been any other message from God apart from the message of his son, Jesus Christ, who was born of the flesh and is the son of God. That message is the power of God. And do you remember we've also seen so far that the power of God saves men and women. The power of God takes a man or a woman from under the wrath of God and brings that individual to experience the mercy of God. And only the power of God can take any person and bring him or her to faith in Jesus Christ and save them from wrath. That's the power of God. Now, to, this morning, I want us to think about how the power of God brings joy and peace to those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what I'm hoping we'll see is this. It needs the power of God to enable us to experience joy, and peace as we go on believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's the Spirit of God then who brings the power of God to enable us to know joy and peace. And the one who invites us to know joy and peace is the God of hope. Our God is not a God who discourages. He's not a God who punishes his people. He's not a God who lets us down. He's not a God who abandons us. He's not a God who says one thing and does another. He doesn't neglect us or overlook us. He is a God of hope. All that God is and all that he has done can be summarized in the word hope. It is God who brings hope to human lives. And that hope is through his son, Jesus Christ. And so the power of the spirit of God is at work enabling us to know joy and peace as we go on believing. So I'm going to try and do this. On the one hand, I'm going to try and lay out for us those things that destroy our joy and peace. And then I'm going to try and show how the God of hope has dealt with those things. And as a result, we can know joy and peace. So let me start by giving you a definition. Why does Paul talk about both joy and peace? And these are two very separate things. So the word joy is that which describes a believer's relationship with God. Joy characterizes that relationship between the man and the woman who believes in God and their relationship with God. So that's joy. Peace describes our relationship to life, to all that goes on every day, to the challenges and the tensions 
and the difficulties and the problems of life. Peace is the word that describes what the power of God can bring to the individual as he or she lives life every single day. So here's the Spirit of God then, who brings the power of God into our lives so that we, in our relationship with God, can know joy. And in our everyday experience, in the home or at work, with relationships, we can know peace, the power of God. So if we start, first of all, with joy. And what Paul does in Romans is this. He spells out the problem we all have in our relationship to God. And that is the problem of sin. And so Paul will spend chapter after chapter of Romans showing how all of us have sinned and we all fall short of the glory of God. We cannot reach the standard to make ourselves acceptable to God. And even after we've come to faith in Jesus Christ, sin remains a problem. We struggle with sin every day. As believers in Jesus Christ, there are things that we want to do to please God, and yet we fail. And there are things we don't want to do because we know them to be displeasing to God. They also displease us because we are now Christian people, and we know there are certain things that we ought not to do as Christians, but we still do them. And so we struggle every day with sin. It once controlled us completely, and so we were enemies of God, and we were under his wrath. But even having been saved, there's this ongoing struggle and battle with sin. The sin that remains in our minds and in our lives. Now, do you know something of this struggle? And so as a believer in God, you're, you're so, so keen to do the right thing. And yet you're so aware of how frail you are of how strong the battle is, how big the problem is of sin. And so you know failure. Do you know that? So what happens is this. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, shows us that the entire problem of sin has been dealt with by God through his son jesus christ and so we come to believe and the spirit of god who is the power of god has the power to open our minds and our hearts and our eyes and to show us that in jesus christ god has made a complete end once and for all of all of our sins all the sin that was true of us before we came to faith in Jesus, but equally all the sin that remains in our everyday experience, all of it has been dealt with by God. And it is done, and it is complete, and it is finished, so that Paul can write in Romans 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We have peace with God through faith in Jesus Christ. And so the power of God works to bring the truth of God to each one of us when we are discouraged by our sins and our mistakes and our failures. The power of God comes to us and shows us that sin is no longer 
an issue between any believer and God. Now, can I just put a note here? And it's a note from my own experience, my personal experience, but also from talking to many of you. And I think there is still a struggle for some of us as Christians to truly believe that all our sin has been dealt with by God. Now, it seems to me that we are quite happy to believe that our past sin has been dealt with. That sin before I became a Christian. We are, we are quite sure, I think, that that sin is gone. But it's the sin that continues. That's where the struggle lies. The sin of yesterday or last week. The sin that will be true of me this week. That's where our struggle is. Has that sin really, truly been dealt with? Because I should be a better Christian. I shouldn't be so weak. I shouldn't be so much of a failure. So because we have this expectation that we should be better Christians than we are, we struggle then with our ongoing sin. And so the Spirit of God, who is the power of God, through the truth of God, shows us that all our sin has been dealt with. There is no exceptions. There are no sins too great, too frequent, too troublesome for God. He has taken them all without exception, and laid them on his son and punished him upon that cross so that there is no longer any sin barrier ever at any point between the believer and God. It is not an issue. And so what the Spirit of God does, who is the power of God, he shows us that we are the ones who make it an issue rather than God himself. God has dealt with it, finished with it, done with it. But it is we who keep our sins alive. And so the Spirit of God says, it is done, it is settled upon the cross. And there are no clouds between you and God. God, who is the Father of lights, he looks upon each of us in the full bloom of his love, in the full brightness of his glory. And there are no issues. And so the joy that our verse talks about is the joy of realization that you will never be asked by God to give an account of your sin. There is no day of reckoning. You have your sins forgiven. There is no prospect of condemnation. All is dealt with and done with by God. And it's the power of God, only that, that is sufficient to show us our sins are done with. So there's joy, joy in our relationship with God because there is nothing any longer that stands between me and God. God finds no fault with me. God has no criticism to make of me. God does not point his finger at any aspect of my life and say, Neil, this is where you're failing. This is where you're not good enough. God does not do that. God welcomes us as sons and daughters of God. He is our heavenly father who has settled our sins. Let's take the word peace. Peace is a description of what a believer can know when it comes to life. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to think about the past week. 
and think about every challenge you face. Think about the difficulties you've known over the past week, perhaps in a relationship, in the family, maybe. Difficulties you may have known at work. Life is tough. It seems, doesn't it, that life is getting tougher. We have situations that all of us face that cause us great stress. We have sleepless nights, maybe. We feel the tension and the heartache of trying to solve the problems that we are faced with. We have all this every day, every week, as we seek to live out our lives in the here and now. Now, what Paul writes here is this. As you live life, the power of God through the power of the Holy Spirit is enough, is able to make us know peace, even as we face all these challenges. It is only the power of God that is sufficient. So by ourselves, none of us, I think, can bring peace to our situations. We can't do it on our own. But the power of God, who is the power of the Holy Spirit, he is able to bring peace to each of us as we face life. So let's see how Paul deals with this in Romans. I want you to turn with me to Romans and uh, chapter 8. And as he brings this chapter to a close, Paul is thinking about life. Life with all its challenges and all its difficulties, with its problems that build up uh, the longer that we live. This is what he says about life. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ. Here we go. Shall tribulation or distress, shall persecution or famine or nakedness, shall peril or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. So there is Paul listing the challenges of life, and he's trying to capture every conceivable challenge that any believer can face. Did you notice it in that list? Shall tribulation, peril, nakedness, sword, distress, famine? He's running out of options to lay out for us what life can bring. In fact, earlier on in the chapter, in verse 18, he says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time, so your present time, last week's time, full of these kind of challenges. You're trying to do your best, and nothing seems to be right. You can't find the answers to what you're facing. This is life, says Paul. And then he writes this. Yet in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded, and here he goes again, he's trying a second time to spell out to you what life can bring to all of us. He says this. Neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things in the present, nor things that are in the future, neither height nor depth, nor anything else shall be able to separate us from the love of God. So here he is spelling it out to you. What is it like to live? and face all the challenges. You and I have got different challenges, haven't we? Some people are facing great challenges in the next week. 
We know of one of our sisters facing surgery in the next couple of weeks. We've all got challenges, and they'll be unique to you. And some challenges we'll talk about to others. Often we'll keep it to ourselves, won't we? And we won't talk about the challenging thoughts that we might have, or the emotions that rack our bodies and make us feel guilty. We shouldn't feel these things, we think. Now, we've all, we're all like this, all of us. But what Paul spells out here in Romans, and the clue is in just one little phrase that we are going to take up tonight. What Paul says very clearly is the power of the Spirit of God is able through believing to give us peace in the midst of all this. The joy and peace through believing. So if you look for that little phrase that is the key, you'll see it in one of these verses. Can you see it? It's in verse 38 of Romans 8. It's a little phrase and it says this, for I am persuaded. That's a phrase that means I uh, believe. I have understood the truth of God. I have understood what God has done, what God has accomplished in his son, Jesus Christ. I've understood about his grace and about his mercy. I've understood these things and I've understood them and the power of the Holy Spirit has persuaded me of them so that I am able to know peace as I live out my life. So the God of hope wants us in our relationship with him to know joy. And the God of hope wants us as we live every single day not to live stressed out and discouraged lives, but he wants us to live lives that are marked by peace. And this comes through the power of the Holy Spirit as we continue to believe. And let me be quite honest, and what I'm describing here I think is something, for me at least, is yet to be realized. I'm not standing here and saying to you by any means that this joy or this peace is something that marks out my life. And I think most of us would say that, wouldn't we? I think most of us would say that we don't know great joy in our relationship with God, and we certainly don't know this peace as we live out our lives day by day. Now, if we can acknowledge that, what I want to say to you is this. We are not to feel bad about that. We are not to be discouraged about that because we have a God of hope. Our God is characterized by hope. Our God invites us to live lives of hope. What I want to say is this, it is only the power of God who can bring that joy and that peace as we go on believing in him. So what I'm doing is making an appeal. It's an appeal to all of us to ask the spirit of power, the one who is the power of God, to enable us to know this joy and to know this peace. We know what we believe. We believe that Christ has accomplished salvation. We believe that he died on the cross for our sins. We believe that the grace of God is available. We believe that the promises of God surround us. And yet there is this lack of joy and peace that we find here in Romans 15 and verse 13. Now, why is it? So it seems to me the reason why is that we have not asked 
the Spirit of God, who is the power of God, to enable us, to give that power to us, that we might know this joy and this peace, because it only comes from him. He alone is sufficient. He alone is greater than the problem of sin and the problems of life. And I think that's what's impressed me more than anything else as I've thought about these verses. Paul, in this letter, spells out just how enormous are the challenges that we face. And the greatest challenge is sin. But there are these other challenges of life in this present time, the sufferings of this present time. And so we have these almost insurmountable challenges in the path of the believer. And so Paul in Romans 15, as he describes himself as a man who preaches this gospel to men and women, he draws their attention to the power of God in the person of the power of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, this is where the power is that you need so that in your relationship with God, you know joy. And in the day-to-day -day of life, you know peace. It is through the power alone of the Holy Spirit as we go on believing. Now, I, I think sometimes when you preach a sermon, you can't cover every aspect. And so you have to make a decision. Which bit do I leave out of this verse? Which bit do I put in? I don't want to say too much, but I will just try this as well, if you don't mind. When you read Romans 15 and verse 13, the emphasis is not on you going on and believing. It's not the pressure to keep believing. It's not Paul saying, now look, as long as you believe, you'll know joy and peace. That's not where the emphasis lies. The fact of believing is taken for granted. We are believers. This is what we do. We've been called to faith in Jesus Christ. So believing is a characteristic of the Christian life. We are believers. It is not there that the emphasis falls. It is on the power of the Spirit who has been sent by the God of hope. It is as we know that power, as we seek to avail ourselves, as we ask God to grant to us the power of the Spirit of God in our day-to-day -day lives, that we then know that joy between us and God and that idea of peace. And it's an ongoing thing. It's a gradual thing. It's a relative thing, I guess. But here is Paul appealing to his Roman readers to come to the spirit of power, to ask the Holy Spirit of the God of hope to so empower us, to help us, to be sufficient for us as we face these tremendous difficulties, if he can empower us, then we will know the joy and the peace that come through as we go on believing together. So one last thing then, Romans 8 is, I think, what Paul has in mind when he writes Romans 15 verse 13. He is pulling together in one verse, what he said in an entire chapter. And Romans 8 is the great chapter about the Holy Spirit. And what we will do, I think, in the weeks to come is we look at Romans 8 and we'll see how the power of the Spirit of God is laid out for us there and how Paul gives this understanding of who the Spirit of God is and what does he do in the lives of believers. That should we grasp that, then we will know the Spirit of God empowering us 
so that there is joy in believing in God and there is peace in the day to day. So here's the end. God of hope, that's the God we have. The God who is characterized by hope. Our God isn't a defeated God. He is not a disinterested God. He is not a dead God. He is the God of hope, who has called us to a living hope, a hope that is steadfast and sure, an anchor for the soul, a hope that is found in the person of Jesus Christ, and the power of the Spirit of God will enable us to know joy and peace through believing. Well, let's pray.